<laughs> Are you on the winning side? It says, let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Come and rejoice some more. Welcome to the prolific teaching ministry of Pastor Emmanuel Ire, lead pastor of Celebration Church International. It is his vision to partner with you for your progress and joy in the faith. Ready, set, grow. Why deeper? What is this program about? A famous quote says, where the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse then becomes inevitable. And so it's important that you understand the heart behind every program that we curate. Because they serve different purposes. Why deeper? Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 5. And whilst you open, just listen to me as I explain. Especially as our ministry evolved into an ev evangelical stroke, apostolic mission, God began to give us an infrastructure to make sure that I can go from city to city where our brethren, our local church exists, for strengthening. Did, did you hear what I said? Yes, sir. Thank God for every other thing that happens. The miracles and everything. But you see, it is called deeper for a reason. Meaning the ultimate goal is that you live strengthened. And strengthening is a concept that is not as popular as it should be. Because it's a, it's a spiritual phenomenon and a very important one at that. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verse 5, media team, are you with us today? It says, so the churches were strengthened. Everybody read this together, one to go. Churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So listen, we don't just want increase in numbers. We want increase in faith. You can increase in faith. You might have been doing okay in your walk with God, but there is, there is something called deeper. There is, there is, oh my God. You can be strengthened in your convictions. Strengthened in the faith. And that's why we're here. And how does this strengthening occur? The Bible also tells us how. The same book of Acts this time around, chapter 15, verse 32. And it's very interesting that you see this word, particularly in the book of Acts, which was a compendium of the Acts of the Apostles. So this is what the Apostles did. And as such, this is what Apostles do. They strengthen. And how do they strengthen? Acts Chapter 15, verse 32, it says, Now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So this is how you know you attended deeper. When down the line, whether in the face of a challenge or just randomly, the word of God just comes alive again. You remember words that you heard. And they comfort your spirit and strengthen your soul. That's what deeper is for. The biggest thing you can leave these places with is words. I say that again. The biggest thing you can leave this place with is words. Thank God for the myriads of miracles that will happen. But guess what? If you receive miracles, you will need another one soon. It's just the way life is. If it's not for you, it will be for someone you love. 
But if you leave this place with words, then we know that your future is secure. And that's why we thought, we taught yesterday on hope as an anchor. And today, I want to teach on prayer as an anchor. Oh my God. A lot of people don't know this ministry of prayer. Listen, we've taught on everything except the most important thing. Thank God for the many things prayers do for us. But what I'm about to share with you is one of the most important teachings you've heard on prayer. One of the most, if not the most important. Come on, are you with me? And I'll just go ahead to say that one of the biggest blessings of prayer is that it births strength in your spirit. And that's so important. As important as all the other things are, strength. And you might have heard me say this before. The most important ministry of prayer is not what it can do for you, but what it does where? In you. you. I can't even begin to emphasize how important this is. Thank God for healings. Thank God for deliverances. Let me tell you this. Have you noticed that it is one thing for you to know something? It is another thing for you to be strengthened in it. And guess what? No matter what you know, if you don't pray, you will not be strong in it. You can't achieve strong convictions without prayer. Teaching has its part. And the part of teaching cannot be overemphasized. It cannot be sidelined. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> you can read a thousand books that say to you that God is a healer. But without a prayer life, you will struggle to believe it. Yeah. Is that true or false? True. Some of you know what I'm saying. Ah, <laughs> have you heard a report before and you almost collapsed? It is in the place of prayer. You might have read books, oh, but prayer toughens your spirit. I know you know Mark 16, 17. You even know it offhand. But when you see a demon manifesting, it's a different thing. Am I saying the truth or not? <laughs> it's, a, it's a totally different ball game. Prayer gives us audacity. And audacity comes from strength. You, you just have to be strong. I'll give you one more example. You can know theologically that you are close to God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. But go two weeks without praying and see if you will believe it. No matter what you know, if you don't have a prayer life, you will not feel close to God. Is it true? It, now, it doesn't mean the person is right, though. Because you are never far from God. But you just won't feel it. Peter did not lie when he says, anybody who acts like this has forgotten that he has put away the old man. You can't forget you can forget. It can be a reality, but a forgotten reality. And you will just be so deflated in your soul. No spiritual energy. Because that can only be achieved by prayer. Only by prayer. There will never be a strong church that is not a praying church. Never. It doesn't matter the quality of teachings there. Because prayer is at anchor. There will never 
be a revival that will last without prayer. Never. It is prayer that makes us strong. Turn to a text you know very familiar, you know, very well, you know, that you're very familiar with. Jude verse 20. I know you know it by heart. Just open it. Jude verse 20. Come on, are you there? Read together, one, two, go. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Oh my God, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Now, to be clear, you don't build yourself, your most holy faith by praying. You build your most holy faith by teaching. <laughs> are you getting what I'm saying? But you build on your most holy faith by praying. Your most holy faith is your Christian tradition, your theology. That's your most holy faith. He calls it most holy because it cannot be adulterated. He's talking about doctrine. You can't add to it. You can't separate from it. He's talking about something wholesome. In fact, if he was talking about charismatic faith, then this will be cumbersome because how can you say you should build on something that is most holy? Most holy is perfect. Most holy cannot be improved. Are you getting what I'm saying? So he's talking about two different things. Your most holy faith is the doctrine of Christ as your foundation. But then there can be an edifice of devotion, of ministry, of a solid Christian work on that foundation. And you have the responsibility to build on it. Come on, say loud amen. amen. Now, why is he talking like this? Because of what is happening around. If you read the context, then you will understand what he's really saying. Let's start from verse 17 now. He says, but you, from verse 17, beloved, Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they, or I beg your pardon, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time. Are there mockers today? Yes. People who just make jest of your tongues, of your devotion. I would have said of your love for your pastor, but that would look too, but so I just, um, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> Mockers in this last time who will walk according to their own ungodly lusts. So now, the question is how does your faith? survive amidst contradiction. Listen, for a long time we've read verse 20 in isolation. So we've never understood it. Are you seeing what I'm saying now? We've never really understood it. But now he's talking about your faith surviving amidst contradiction. You travel to a country where the Christian faith is not popular. How do you survive? Verse 19 says, these people are sensual who cause divisions. Now, they try to divide you. Try to bring suggestions that make you second guess your convictions. False doctrines, false narratives, you know, whatever it is. And he says, having not the spirit. Then he says, but you. He, he has talked about the other people. He now says, he now focuses on you. Building up yourselves. Apataya. In an environment where you should get weaker, you can get stronger. And he tells you how. This is the strategy. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Verse 21. Everybody, verse 21, together. One, two, go. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You see that? Now, this is the unpopular ministry of prayer. 
preservation in the love of God. Meaning, if you want to last in an environment of contradiction, you must pray. See, it's okay that you read books, you have the doctrine, you have most holy faith, you have understanding of all these things. Ah! Do you know how strong negative influence is? You know, there was a video I saw about four days ago. A lady was in her church, and in her church, all ladies are required to tie their hair, you know. And just imagine you're in church, you look back, and behind you is David O. This really happened. So for some reason, he went to that church. And the lady brought out her phone in church, you know, and then remembered, oh, this is David O behind me. I shouldn't be wearing my head tie. So in church, she removed it, you know, <laughs> on camera. And she, you know, she pouted and all of that. <laughs> Listen. It, you see, we can play church for aeons. Never underestimate the power of negative influence. And by the way, I, you know, the doctrine of head covering, that one is, I'm not even saying it's right or wrong. But the, the issue is, she felt it was right to cover her hair. At least she felt so. But when she saw someone with whom she wanted to belong, in seconds, she removed it. And I said, ah, do you, listen, let me tell you something. As a pastor, that thing said it preached a thousand sermons. You can be playing church. Yeah? There is something called the testing of your faith. You know, in school, when the teacher explains, explains, do you understand? Yes. <laughs> Tear a sheet of paper, you start crying. <laughs> but you said you understand. It is when you are tested that strength is revealed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me shock you. Strength is not revealed here. <laughs> I know some of you have prayed. Do you understand? When you go out, <laughs> we want to see how you are able to cope. And this is the strategy for keeping your conviction in an environment of strategy. You beloved! You need to build. I know you know. So that lady in her mind, and that's the annoying thing. If it is another Christian that has like a doctrinal debate or inquiry, do you have to cover your head? She will never agree. No. But let someone flashy stay behind that. The doctrine will disappear. The doctrine... <laughs> hey, my God. Do you understand what I'm saying? But to you, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Like, as you await, as you, as you cry, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord, waiting for the coming of Christ, this is your strategy for preservation. Building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Say loud, Amen. amen. Like I said, this doesn't in any way undermine the other reasons a lot of people pray for. When you pray for a healing, the, the Bible does say, is any sick among you, let them call for the elders. Let them anoint them with oil. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick. But let's, let me tell you this. Guess what? The sickness and all the other trials are a distraction. What the devil is really after is your faith. Oh my God, if you understand this, whew, your eyes will be open. Listen, and when Paul says, for we are not ignorant of his devices, it will have a new meaning in you. When the devil attacked Job, it was so that Job, with his back against the wall, will curse God. It was his faith that he was after. Do you get it? 
for we think it's about the sickness. And we think it's about the financial frustration. We think it's about all these other things. So I I'm telling you that nine out of ten prayers in the body of Christ today is focusing on the distraction. But what the devil really wants is your faith. And so the Bible says, build on it. Just like the foundation of a house is hidden. Come on, I get what I'm saying? Build on that foundation, on your most holy faith. Build around it. Don't leave it open for attack. Build on it. Listen to me, you will need this sermon soon. A major shaking is coming in the next 10 years. This is the first time I'm saying it. A major shaking. There are some things that I know I'm not permitted to say yet. A plan of the devil that is a century old will come into full-blown manifestation in the next 10 years. And except the church responds, not just with strategies, which we'll talk about later, but with teachings like this, we will not be ready. So just like Jesus said to, to Peter, I'm telling you, Simon, Simon, the devil seeks to have you. There's a plan. I'm exposing the plan now to sift you like wheat, wheat until you just... You'll be a if you're not careful, people will see old pictures of you praying and be like, this was you? I can't believe it. You have to learn to build. Prayer is for fortification against deception. Did you hear what I just said? Fortify yourself against this deception. Faith is a defense. And prayer strengthens that defense. This is what the Bible was trying to describe. Using the metaphors of weapons of war. The belt of truth. Come on, are you with me? So this means he's talking about doctrine. Not charismatic faith. But doctrine. Come on, do you get that? The belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. So that means he's talking about salvation and how the devil is trying to move you from that. And he says, the shield of what? Faith is your defense. When you hear any, any worldview, or theology, or suggestion that is against the knowledge of Christ. What's your defense? Faith. What you have believed, what you've learned of the Lord, that's your defense. The shield of faith. The shield of faith is information fortified by prayer. Are you getting what I'm saying? Doctrine fortified by prayer. That's what it is. Now, If the shield of faith is doctrine, what are the fiery darts of the enemy? You, you, you see, we've been so distracted. We think the fiery darts are the plan of the enemy to make you sick. He might do that, but that's by the way. The fiery darts will be any attack against your conviction. That's what it is. Against your conviction. Any well orchestrated information against what the Bible teaches about God, moral law, marriage, and all those things. Let me tell you something, and it can come in the most subtle ways. Nobody's going to get a lactin and preach over you. No. 
You're just going to see your faves, celebrities that you adore in a movie. And in the movie, maybe they are meeting for the first time. Now, listen, subconsciously, we all love love. And the devil knows how to use the things that we are vulnerable about to get us to shift the position of our conviction. So you see two people that you really like, and in your mind, they look good together. We have a false perception of a decent relationship, and that also is engineering. Every love story is, is told using super attractive people. Are we telling the truth or not? Yes, and that's why a lot of Christian brothers are blind. Wow. I, someone needs to say it. Because there are great God-fearing ladies in church. But you would rather go for someone who has done liposuction. I said it. Deal with it. Am I saying the truth or not? You, you, see, let me tell you something. Our ideas have been so damaged, we don't even know a good wife anymore. You, you, you can't tell if you see one. You, you can't tell. And I've been married long enough to let you know that even the most perfect shape you will be tired after three months with a bad attitude. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about men. Their greatest love language is consideration and honor. No matter the shape. Hmm? Excuse me, you don't understand. <laughs> If the relationship is not going well, a man will not see beauty in you. I'm telling you. you. A man will never find a lady attractive who doesn't value him. And mind you, a lady who has spent close to 100 million to put contours on the body is not about to stay under one roof. Generally speaking, I'm, I'm not saying not everybody, who, are you, do you understand? I'm not saying everybody who does that has that plan. But generally speaking, is that, <laughs> is that true or false? Okay, you said it. <laughs> so, now, as someone who is married, I see some things in the movies that they sell. And I'm just like, okay, you were going somewhere. Your book fell. You were trying to pick it up. You know, she was trying to pick it up for you. Your, your fingers touched. Instantly, there was a chemistry. You know, I've said this many times before. The camera began to pan around both of you. You know, wind from nowhere started blowing. Her hair started moving like this. Do you understand? It's love at first sight. And in, in some movies, they go straight to the bedroom. Now, this is the annoying part. They start breaking things. As a <laughs> See, let me tell you something. In real life, no matter the love, just break TV. It, I will open. <laughs> those, those things are not real. <laughs> those, those things are not real. But they've sold it well. And now, you don't know what to desire. You don't know what to desire. You will marry someone and start stressing the person. Simple sex, you are not satisfied. Why? You, you did not hold the roof like this. You, don't, you, you are the problem. You are the problem. Where did you learn that you are supposed to hold roof? <laughs> hmm. 
It has to be said. It has to be said. Laugh, but you know what I'm saying is true. So now, it was not presented in a sermon. It was presented in several movies with this all realistic, and that's why it looks like engineering. If that's not real life, how come it is portrayed over and over again until people began to act that way? So that's it. That's how your faith is being attacked, and you need to know. The shield of faith. So when you see it, no, this is not marriage. This is foolishness. This is foolishness. <laughs> foolishness. Love at first sight is foolishness. Oh, yes. You need... Love at first sight is what? It is foolishness. No, no such thing. And I'm one of the few brave people left in the world to tell you the cartoons lied. They lied, sir. For the benefit of those of you who have not heard me say this, in the cartoon, a prince will go into a forest, see a corpse in a coffin, and kiss the corpse. And somehow, that was romantic to you. There is a name for it. It's called necromancy. Oh my God, you are not ready. In the cartoons, a young, beautiful girl fell in love with a beast. And that's a romantic story. There's a name for that. It's called bestiality. <laughs> Listen, and in the story, she didn't fall in love with the beast with assurance he would change. Mm -hmm. I'll be now. Yes, you know the story now. <laughs> because somewhere in your mind, you're already saying, I am, but he changed now. She kissed him as a beast. Yes or no? Yes. Uh, she kissed a beast. Then you're now wondering why, years down the line, some people in Lekki are acting the way they're acting. I'm talking based on what's on the news. Right? At least reportedly. The shield of faith. Say what me say, the shield of faith. So, now, it takes a lot of audacity. For instance, that example again, I have, you know, first and foremost, not many celebrities will go to church. So it's really commendable that he actually went to church. But when you look back and you see someone highly celebrated as a superstar like that, and your prayer does not change, you still express yourself before the Lord. You don't, you don't. <laughs> That's when you know that you have built your conviction. Say loud amen. amen. When you know that there is no place in the world where you will not boldly say, as occasion demands, I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God. No matter the favors that you might miss because of that, that's when you know that your conviction has been built. I'm telling you again, you will need this teaching. Amen, somebody. Amen. <laughs> oh, God. This is a very important teaching on prayer. Let me give you another text that a lot of people have not really understood in context. First and foremost, uh, let me, I, I've given you Bible study tools, right? When the Bible says that you may quench the fiery darts of the enemy in Ephesians chapter 6, what Greek word is that? I've taught you how to check all those things. 
What is the Greek word for fiery darts? Wait in the oko. What's the Greek word for darts? <laughs> All right. This is a mixed multitude, so let's leave that. After two days. <laughs> All right. Move to First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. You know First Peter chapter 5 verse 8, right? So just to be sure you're following, Jude verse 20, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. So the, this, the discourse does not end in verse 20. Verse 20 literally ends with a comma. So 21 tells you why we pray in the Holy Ghost, amongst many other reasons. Because when we build on our most holy faith, that's fortification. And so we are kept in the love of God. Say loud, amen. amen. You are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Now, 1 Peter chapter 5, another popular text, verse 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, Right? So now you know that. And they've taught it in several spiritual warfare sermons. Be sober, vigilant. The devil is coming. Ah, I'm praying, you know, and all of that. But now, let's follow the flow of thought from verse 7. From verse 7, it says, Casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Oh, my God. So listen, this sobriety involves how you handle tribulation. You are sober not by avoiding alcohol alone. <laughs> or even praying alone. Or fasting alone. Or being watchful alone. How do you handle trials? Let me tell you something that touched me. So in the U.S., I gave a word of knowledge. I said there is a lady here. You had a sharp contention with your husband. And as far as you are done, you are concerned, the marriage is done. But the Lord is asking me to tell you to hang in there with a little more patience. So she came to me after the service crying. What happened? I'll tell you. Their first son, about the age of eight, was confirmed autistic. And it shook the faith of the man. It shook it so bad. He began to say he's not sure he believes in God anymore. And so, I mean, she just thought it was the season and he was going to go past it. Until the man started telling the other children that he does not believe in God. That's where the woman began to protest. Now, don't affect the faith of our kids. I won't take that. And she felt it was strong enough reason for the marriage to be dissolved immediately to save her children. And I don't exactly disagree with that. Whatever your convictions are. Well, the prophetic word said patience. But it got me thinking. On one hand, we believe in charismatic faith. That all things are possible. No sickness without a cure. Every devil flees the door. But there is a way in which we drive that at the expense of salvific or saving faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's almost as if the prosperity of our charismatic faith is what determines the continuation of our saving faith. And it's a problem. Because if a man discovers that one of his sons has a sickness and no longer believes in God, it means that he only believed in God as long as... Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? And so, listen, that's what I'm telling you. All the trials and tribulation are a distraction. The reason why the devil attacked Job's health is so that he will curse God. And that's what he's really after.
Now you're here, you're trusting for a healing, and that's good. But it's important that you have saving faith in spite of that. Where you can say, what can separate me from the love of God? Do, are, are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. Come on, are you here? Yes. Where you say, see, listen, you are seeking healing. People who were whole gladly took sickness, caught my neck, caught my hand. I will not renege my commitment to the Lord. As long as people embraced persecution willfully, it must influence our perspective of charismatic faith, which we also believe in unrepentantly until the end. There must be that balance. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, meaning we are ready to die. Yea, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Until you can get to that point, the devil can still get you. He will use convenience if you are the son of God, turn stone to bread. How can he hold you so spiritual, fasting? You are still facing this contradiction. Why are you hungry? After all, you're praying. Your mates have jobs. You don't have bread on your table. He's going to use convenience. And now you just think the focus is prosperity. Every devil hindering my prosperity. You are not exactly wrong. But that is just a distraction. The real bone of contention is your faith. Do you get this? Oh my God, if you get this, this is life changing if you ask me. And this is why the prosperity doctrine is dangerous. Overemphasis on needs will provide a, a weak church. A mega church can disappear in one sweep. So now there's a pandemic, and some people don't want to go to church again. Where was God? What Bible are you reading? How many famines were in the Bible? How many famines? Where, how did we come to a point where we feel that trouble and trials in the world contradict the existence of God? Who do us this thing? You think you've seen famine? Read your Bible well. Where people began to take turns to eat their children. Have you gotten to that? Have you read that in the Bible? Where it got so bad, and I say, okay, this is what we do. How many children do you have? God forbid. <laughs> ah, this one is skinny. Bring the one with flesh. That's what they were doing. But we've sold a brand of Christianity that gives the impression that you won't go through stuff just because God is with you. Even though the Bible says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Oh, Jesus. That alone says a lot. The presence of trouble is not the absence of God. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. And your rod and staff comfort me. I'm not careful to answer you, O King. We will not bow. We will not bow. Not, not even in front of a fiery furnace. Now, that's Christian conviction. Come on, are you getting it? And prayer fortifies. You can't talk like that. You must be high on something. <laughs> you have to be high on something to talk like that.
<laughs> I need to keep my phone away. <laughs> my wife just sent me a message. Edima is listening to me preach. And when she heard me talk about the temptation of Jesus, she said, thank God I don't like bread. <laughs> That's what she said. Please take the phone before I laugh for you. <laughs> she, said, she, said, she said, thank God I don't, thank God I don't like bread. <laughs> One less thing the devil can tempt me with. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> Hallelujah. Are you being blessed? Yes, sir. There are some of you. I mean, this couldn't be more timely. This couldn't be more timely. So now, you know, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, who walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Be sober. It is in doing that that you're sober and you're vigilant. And then, verse 9, resist him. How? Resist him how? Because you know what he's after. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. He can take everything. There is one thing he can only take if you give him. And that's your conviction. Resist him steadfast in the faith. I'm frustrated. I won't stop believing though. I won't stop going to church. I don't know why this and this and this is happening. I won't stop praying. I won't stop singing. I won't stop. Listen, it doesn't matter the rule in Babylon. I will still open my window every morning and my voice will be heard in heaven upon my bed before I sleep. First thing when I wake up, I will meditate on the kingdom for as the deer pans for the water brooks so my soul hungers for you in a dry and thirsty land where no water is for in you O god is a fountain of life in your light i have seen light resist him steadfast in the faith Knowing that the same sufferings, so he's talking about suffering. The same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So listen, he's not even talking about resisting the suffering, which you can. He's talking about resisting in spite of the suffering. Ah, did you get that? If you're only steadfast in the faith when the suffering stops, there's a problem with your faith. So it's your consolation, knowing that many people are going through the same, resisting in spite of it. I know what you're after. What, okay, why is the devil attacking your finances? What does he want to buy with it? It's your faith is after. Why is he after your marriage? Why is he after your parents? It's your faith is after. If he can bring you to a point where you say, ah, God allowed all this, I'm not sure anymore. Then he's got you. And maybe that's one reason Job went through all he went through. So that no matter how painful your experience is, he show me, he no pass Job. He no pass Job. He no pass Job. And the Bible says, so that we, through the comfort of scriptures, may have hope. When you look at other people, say, ah, I'm just starting now. <laughs> I'm, I'm just starting. Hallelujah. <laughs> you 
Thank you, Lord. One more text and then we call it a day. Luke twenty two thirty one. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. One wire. One you want wire me. One you want wire this. They are looking for you. <laughs> they, are, they are looking for you. They are making inquiries on you. And this is what he wants. Not your health, not your business, even though he's going to use every means to get his actual goal. He wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to sift you. Hallelujah. He wants to sift you. And then this is what verse 32 says. But I've prayed for you. That's what prayer does. Strengthens you. I've prayed for you. Why? What is, the, what, do, what is the prayer meant to do? That your faith should not fail. And then he says, when you have returned, strengthen your brothers. Do the same for the... So this is, this is something that must become a culture in the church. Praying for you. That your faith will not fail. He will either, either do that through scarcity or abundance. Turn stone to bread. You pass that. All right. Jump from the pinnacle of the temple. Why should it be so difficult? Always seek the fast route. After all, you are a child of God. Why climb down when you can jump down, when you have angels? As ridiculous as that seems, some of you do that. When you can read. Why read when I can ask God for area of concentration? <laughs> and this is how the devil uses convenience to lure us away from God's plan. And it to sound religious. Let me, let me show you. I, I said that's the last text, but open this quickly. Romans chapter 8, right? Romans chapter 8, verse 35. <clears throat> Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall tribulation... Listen, does God want tribulation for you? No. But tribulation at the same instance should not be sufficient to take me from the love of Christ. It shouldn't be the condition for my continuing my faith in God. Even though God doesn't want it. But you see, the devil uses... The fact that God doesn't want these things. Ah, God doesn't want you poor. So why are you poor? You, you see the logic? To make your faith in God conditional. And then there's a way we preach that suggests that it is or it should be. Shall tribulation or distress, does God want you in distress? Answer me. Or persecution. Why did, why would the apostles say, pray for us that we should be delivered from wicked and unreasonable men? It means that even if God can use persecution to strengthen his church, he doesn't want us to be persecuted. He doesn't want it, even though it's necessary. Or famine. Does God want famine? Or nakedness. Does God want nakedness? Or peril or sword. These are things that God doesn't want. But the devil can weaponize them against you. And subtly, in the name of getting you blessed, he will replace God with appetites. And you will still be religious about it, thinking you are seeking God. Meanwhile, you are seeking appetite. And the proof is this. The moment it seems like praying to God is not satisfying those needs, you replace God. You sack him. You don't believe anymore. You see that? 
or when science begins to give alternatives why pray why trust God why this is the strategy of the enemy and all of this can be handled with prayer come on are you with me <laughs> all of this can be handled with prayer if you pray the enemy will not be able to sift you as wheat he won't be able to separate you from your convictions he won't be able that's the sifting he will not be able because you've got the shield of faith come on say I've got the shield of faith stand to your feet and demonstrate it I've got the shield of faith what about in your health Listen, so I know that God heals, but he doesn't have to heal to be God. He's God nonetheless. He will heal, but I'm not going to wait for him to do it to know that he's God. He's God. Yea, in all these things. Listen. And do you know that this must become a mentality in church? When you see someone in church who doesn't have something, do you subconsciously look at the person as though there is something wrong in the person's devotion? Because there is that proclivity to look at someone who, like the guy in John 9, you ask God, who sinned? Who sinned? Because something must have been wrong. And, and God, Jesus said, nobody. Nobody. Come on, do you get this? Yes, Loki, you are giving people that eye. Why are you still single? Giving them that eye of pity. Huh? Oh, and she can pray. Oh. <laughs> Listen, you need to renew your mind. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. And in, listen, learn to be able to see people in spite of their challenge. That you are first and foremost a child of God. Hallelujah. Let hope. Rise, darkness trembles in your holy light, and every eye will see Jesus. Ah, great and mighty to be praised. Yes. Let hope rise, and let hope. Darkness tremble in your holy light, and every eye will see Jesus. Ah, great and mighty. You've exalted the darkness above hope, but right now, as we sing, say, Let hope come on, and let darkness. Darkness trembles in your holy light, and every eye will see Jesus, ah, great and mighty to be. God of all. in all of your ways majesty that this sermon was for someone. You, 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 listen, you've been hanging by a thread, but this sermon is your deliverance. Because there are still Hebrew boys today who in front of the fiery furnace 
that is even licking off and burning people who want to throw them in, they still won't bow. Say that I still won't bow. Say I still won't bow. I don't know why, but I still won't bow. I still won't bow. Hallelujah. I want to give you a few minutes because some of you, the devil has attacked you. Make this confession right now. I'm giving you a few minutes to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Because I will worship no one else but the living God. And he alone will I bow to. No shortcuts, devil. No shortcuts, devil. Hope is rising. That people look at all you've gone through and you still go to church. You still have a prayer language. You still know how to read your Bible. Having done all, stand. That's real victory. Even people who hate Jesus will follow him with good incentive. But you see, the contradictions highlight your faith more than anything. I still won't bow. In the midst of the fiery furnace, I still won't bow. No matter what I face, I still won't bow. I am not alone, so I still won't bow. Still, I still won't bow. In the fiery furnace. I still want to bow. Keep on the labor higher. Cause I am not alone. I still want to bow. Still bow. I may not know the way out. Hey, but I still want to bow. Still bow. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So for that person who this sermon was for, right now, just like in Acts 15:2 that we read, you are strengthened. Hope is rising. Hope is rising. Hope is rising. And your anchor is not prosperity. Your anchor is the Lord himself. Your faith and your hope is alive. And you are leaving this place stronger than you came. Be strengthened. By the spirit in your inner man. Be strengthened. In the name of Jesus. And the plan of the enemy to defeat you. With the contradictions. The fatigue. Those battles are won right now. You are a victor. You are a victor. You are, you are a victor. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even your faith. Your faith is winning. I said your faith is winning. I said your faith is winning. Your faith is winning the war because you are strengthened. Come on, the greater one lives in you. The greater one lives in you. You won't bow. <laughs> you won't fear what the enemy can do to you. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Give him praise right now. Give him praise and worship him. <laughs> <laughs> 